Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the work for peace and against war of one of our great peace activists, Kathy Kelly, who is still working to help resettle young Afghans from Afghanistan, among many other projects. She is also the board president, uh, we are very grateful to say, of World Beyond War. She has been uh, in New York City lately working on uh, various projects, and we want to hear what she's been up to. Kathy Kelly, welcome to Talk World Radio. Well, thank you, David. Uh, you know, it's uh, I'm always so pleased to introduce myself as being from an organization that is already against the next war, that wants to abolish all wars, that doesn't want to cherry pick and go to the delicatessen and say, well, we'll have a little bit of that, but we don't want this. And so uh, that's been really important for governing um, my own feelings about how we really are at war with the planet right now. I mean, there's a war being waged against Mother Earth in a sense as we face ecological collapse and the forever wars bring us closer and closer to possible nuclear annihilation. So World Beyond War seems just as crucial as can be to me right now. It, uh, it, it does put us a little out of step with most people to be against all the wars. Uh, There's so many people in this country that you and I live in who want to be against the war in Gaza, but not against the war in Ukraine. Uh, and not so much against the war in Gaza if a particular political party is for it. Um, there was this uh, political convention of the Democrats recently in Chicago and this outcry we must have a palestinian voice included not we must have a voice for peace not me we must have a voice for an arms embargo but the whole identity obsession we must have a palestinian voice and they got a palestinian to draft a speech that was utterly worthless didn't mention the existence of weapons etc and even that they said no to um but i felt out of step with the entire thing i i don't know uh, how you felt um, and and what you think is is happening now with the war on Gaza? Well, I think the Democratic National Committee has been um, feckless and dangerous in uh, not drawing our attention to all of the forever wars, to the toxic, cancerous tentacles of militarism coursing through our entire society. And then, of course, the hideous violations of international law and the underpinnings of any kind of international law that are happening because Israel can continue to wage massacres every single day, afflicting Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza. And, and claim, well, we have to do this because we have to destroy Hamas, as though all the people who've been killed, maimed, forcibly displaced, traumatized, uh, diseased, are every single one of them part of Hamas. So it's a, it's a very, very dangerous time right now. And the Democratic National Convention seemed, I thought, completely out of step with world reality. Actually, I think world beyond war is much more in step with the actual realities that people are facing all around the world as they try to cope with the great terrors we face. And that's the terror of nuclear annihilation. And with the recent incursions into Kursk by the Ukrainians, uh, you know, this is an incursion into a nuclear armed country and there's going to possibly be retaliation um, with the risk of war. Uh, certainly when we think about nuclear war being as high as it is, and then the ecological collapse being what it is, and the possibility of new pandemics. These are the terrors we really face. But I don't see people in government wanting to tackle those at all. So to some extent, I thought, well, okay, let's go to the UN. And you know, Dave, but I was kind of surprised. We're little people. I mean, I I have a degree in theology. Uh, um, I'm not a lawyer. I, I you know, I'm an ex-con who didn't pay her taxes for most of her adult life. So 
you know, we're we're not people that have the big impressive credentials, but do you know every single mission to the UN after getting a really forthright letter detailing how it was our belief that they're now under obligation because of the ruling of the International Court of Justice on July 19, 2024, that they have an obligation uh, now to stop sending weapons to Israel and stop all trade with Israel. And some of these missions represent countries that do billions of dollars of trade or at least millions of dollars of trade. And we mostly wanted to meet with missions represented on the Security Council. 13 countries said yes to the meetings and the average length of time for each meeting was an hour to an hour and a half. And we were talking in the case of Ireland with the ambassador to, of Ireland to the United Nations in the case of most of these countries, the first secretary. Now, granted, it's August and that's a slow month. And maybe they didn't have a whole lot else to do, but it made me realize that the outlier country, that the missions to the UN are most wanting to shun is the United States and the country that we protect, Israel. But so why the heck don't they do it? Why do they occasionally bring up a resolution in the Security Council and have the United States veto it and that's that and dust off their hands and they're done? And they don't repeat that every day as they should and they don't take it to the General Assembly and use the Uniting for Peace resolution to circumvent the Security Council and the United States veto and uphold the rule of law through the General Assembly. Uh, I, I mean, this is what we were asking for, right? And I said we were little people, but actually Rob Jureski is a very accomplished lawyer. Um, Sam Husseini has uh, a lifetime of trying to pursue exactly those questions that you're asking. Sarah Durand is a university professor with the city universities who um, was quite allied with the student movement. Uh, Claire Schaefer Duffy is a, a lifelong peace activist. So we we tried to be just as forthright as you were in asking those questions. I have to say that part of the reason maybe the meetings were kind of long was because nobody wanted to really answer those questions. And there was a lot of kind of dancing around, well, we have to defer to the Palestinians and they should be the ones to come up with a resolution. And I said, well, wait a minute. Why would you think that the Palestinian mission to the UN is representative of all Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza right now, for one thing? And then secondly, what does that have to do with your obligation under the ruling of the International Court of Justice, which clearly says you signed on to the Genocide Conventions, Article 1, or you signed on to Geneva Conventions, Article 1 again, and and it's right there that you now have an obligation to stop your trade with Israel and stop sending weapons. So I think people are afraid. I think their main obstacle, although some countries in Europe said, well, we have to be in consensus with the European Union. Well, that could take forever, right? But I think their main concern was that the U.S. will retaliate and punish any country that goes up against it. And so it, 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 the message for us, because we were all U.S. people, was, well, don't you think you should go after your own country? And of course we should. But we were thinking, we, yeah, that's, that's, that's not very productive these days. How about we try? The, but I'm not going to give hope on this, uh, give up hope on this. I think that, you know, there are other plans and means that, can be used as the opening of the United Nations commences in September. I think that we've seen some brilliant, uh, massive actions in, in New York City, for instance, at the Grand Central Station when the Jewish Voice for Peace and Peace Action and so many other groups, World Beyond War was in favor of it, uh, shut down Grand Central Station. So, um, you know, there are plenty of other nonviolent actions that can take place. And the other thing that I think should be looked at and it gets dismissed just so quickly, but it shouldn't be, is the capacity for not only uniting for peace, and we should talk more about that, but also 
unarmed civilian protection, because I don't think it would be a good idea to send in weapons and helmeted, blue helmet soldiers and tanks and try to say, well, we don't think you should let force be the final determinant, but here we come with massive force. And that's what happens when you send in armed peacekeeping groups. But unarmed peacekeeping groups do exist. And our treasurer for World Beyond War, John Ruhr, is an expert now, along with Charles Johnson and quite a few others, in, and Mel Duncan, uh, David Berrien, in the formation and development of unarmed civilian protection. What can they do? Well, they can monitor to make sure that the uh, stipulations of a ceasefire are being obeyed. They can do rumor busting. They can live alongside people who are at particular risk. And 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 you and I have both done that, David, in various places. And it's it's um, plausible. So we wanted the UN to think about that. And they they pour money into so many different United Nations operations, which is good. But they rather than send a, a highly expensive armed UN peacekeeping mission, I think it would be better to support the unarmed civilian protection effort that the nonviolent peace force has already advanced. And David Hartso, who is our um, board member par excellence uh, and has a lifetime history of this, can certainly talk about that as well. Uh, absolutely much better, uh, as well as to do anything that can be done to uphold the ruling, as you say, of the International Court of Justice uh, to kick Israel out of the United Nations, to punish those nations that are arming the genocide. It seems like we made, did a similar effort and it took a long time and it was frustrating and we weren't getting anywhere. And finally, one nation came through to get that case brought in the first place to the International Court of Justice. And the nation that finally came through was the government of South Africa. I, I can understand the, well, we need to wait for the Palestinians, but what about, we need to wait for South Africa. They brought the case uh, and there are several other countries that signed on to the case. And now the ruling is being blatantly disregarded. Don't we just need to find one heroic country again? And why couldn't it be one of the same ones that we found before? Well, that's what we've had in italicized paragraphs, even in our thank you letters. We're saying, oh, and by the way, you know, South Africa went out on a limb and look what happened. They got a lot of support. So isn't it possible that one country could have that kind of courage? And it's so interesting. It's little Slovenia and Malta, the tiny countries that seem like, you know, the most possible, you know, to be the mouse that roared. But, you know, um, Denmark uh, is is a country that we can't help but place some hope in. Slovenia will preside over the uh, Security Council. Uh, we, 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 we place some hope in Senegal. Uh, so I think we just have to keep on pushing this. But the Uniting for Peace resolution is so interesting. The one time when that worked rather swiftly, Uniting for Peace means that you, you get the two thirds of the General Assembly to unite together to say, look, the Security Council is an impasse to a very necessary, urgent peacemaking move because members of the Security Council are vetoing perfectly good resolutions. And I think you need seven members of the Security Council to agree with you. So that's not unthinkable at this point. Um, but when it was invoked, when uh, the, the UK and France invaded Egypt, the United States didn't want transshipment through the Suez Canal to be uh, disrupted. So the US pressed forward with a uniting for peace resolution. And this is right in the region of Gaza, right? And they it worked. They were able to uh, get this uniting for peace resolution to overcome France and the UK having invaded Egypt and France and the UK uninvaded Egypt and were sent packing basically. So it's not impossible that something like this resolution could be used. And because, and this is a bit arcane to me, but because there has always been an emergency 
uh, commission called over the situation in Gaza. It was that has never been canceled. It's never it's been adjourned, but it's still on the books. You don't even need to introduce a new resolution. You can just appeal to the fact that this uh, concern for Gaza is already there in the United Nations. Yeah. So but the most important thing is to keep on seeing the humanity of every single person who has been bereaved, displaced, maimed, diseased, uh, and afflicted while U.S. weapons are shipped over there in enormous, just shameful, depthless, depthlessly cruel ways. We are speaking with Kathy Kelly, who is president of World Beyond War. Kathy, we, we saw before this summer these encampments in at universities uh, around the world take off uh, in part uh, because of authoritarian and misguided Im imbecilic officials in New York City and media presence in New York City, uh, the same the same thing that created the Occupy movement, right? Um, and we've seen them spread around the globe, but we've seen them largely die down uh, with the summer and with the lack of media attention. Um, what what do you make of the potential uh, for action by young people uh, at college or otherwise uh, to help with peace at this time? Well, I, you know, it just is remarkable to me that the students are so articulate and thoughtful. And, you know, it, I don't I didn't really think they were getting this through their university educations. And I kind of puzzle over how did they learn all this? But um, for instance, we at World Beyond War decided to give the Youth Abolishers, War Abolishers Award to the um, students at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. And what they realized was that they could really use a nonviolence tactic by barricading and sh shutting down the Book of Kells, which is a major tourist industry income earner that happens to be located on their campus. And gosh, the negotiators got to the table pretty quickly. And so they were able to, uh, with their encampment, be successful. Well, that went all around the student networks. And so now you hear students uh, at Northampton, uh, UMass, uh, students up at Ithaca, uh, in Ithaca at Cornell University, thinking about, okay, what are the new means um, that we have to use. Maybe we can't continue to do what worked last spring. We have to think of new methods. And so we've had a chance to hear from some of these student organizers and they're thinking about alumni gatherings and might that be a time when they would interfere uh, and interrupt. They're thinking about um, student moratoriums, which were very useful during the Vietnam War. Just uh, don't go to class. And the professors will start to get nervous. Uh, so will the university chancellors have your own classes and teach yourselves things that are going to be very valuable to continue your movement. Um, some are thinking about students striking who are employed by the campuses. Now, of course, that's risky because if you don't show up for your job, you might not have your job and you might not have your scholarships. And but then, you know, well, what about a student strike for peace? What about a student-led student strike for peace? Isn't it possible that the United Auto Workers and other unions would get on board that faith-based groups who have already started signing documents saying we're with the students, that they might not get on board? I was so impressed that when we met with the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations, uh, one of the people said, are your students going to be having a rumble again? <laughs> Are your students going to be having a rumble again? And I said, oh, I hope so. So I think we'll hear a rumble that could become a roar. As you mentioned, when the uh, outside agitators become the helmeted ninja turtle outfitted police forces, uh, students aren't going to take very kindly to that. And they're going to remember who in their uh, university student services tried to protect them and who didn't. And so those discussions will continue to happen as well. And it's international and it's intergenerational.
I hope the high schoolers walk out. Um, you know, we, we, they have a future. Even the nursery school students are impacted directly by the future of this foolish, foolish militarism. No question. Um, what the what the students at Trinity in Dublin won from their university was divestment, uh, at least from Israeli weapons companies and some other colleges, including in the United States, have won divestment. And many of them, this has been their demand, take our money, take our institution's money out of weapons dealers. In some cases, they don't make the in my view, rather silly distinction between Israeli weapons dealers and all weapons dealers, but divestment from all weapons dealers. Um, and it, 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 it seems like there have been some successes. There, there, there's a big uh, French insurance company was just compelled to divest from, from Israel. Um, what are the, what are the, ch this is something of course that World Beyond War has worked on for years, getting, getting cities to divest, but uh, what are the chances of this continuing and developing and, and succeeding? And not, not everybody has, a, you know, has an easily blocked uh, massive stream of income from some, from some tourist uh, site on their campus. Um, what, you know, what can be done uh, to make divestment succeed? Well, education, education, education. I'm grateful that the students made it clear to us that these universities are like massive hedge funds. They take the student money for tuition and the endowments that they get, and then they invest that. And you know they, they bundle it all together and they try to dodge and say, oh, well, you know, we can't really separate out what was invested in weapons. Well, probably investments in big pharma and you know real estate really aren't really great either. But they take that money and invest it, and then they get a tax break because so it's like rope a dope. And so we need to understand the criminality of people's hard earned income being used for purposes that they they're never consulted about, and that if they could weigh in, I mean the polls show that there's not approval for what. The United States is doing in its multiple forever wars. And so, um, you know, this might be lore. I'm not 100% sure it's true. But what I've read is that Alfred Nobel, you know, he was monkeying around in a lab and he and his cousin, are, they, they, they discovered nitroglycerin. Boom. Things They could blow things up. And so they made a lot of money and probably fostered the capacity of nation states to go to war. Well, Nobel's brother died, but a journalist got it wrong and thought that Alfred Nobel had died and wrote up the obit and called him a merchant of death. And Alfred Nobel thought, uh-uh, uh-uh, I am not going to have that be my legacy. And he started funneling the money that he'd earned I think in horrible ways into giving out these peace prizes. Well, maybe there are some other CEOs that aren't going to want to go down in history as merchants of death. And so, you know, following World War I, it's so interesting to me that there were 100 Senate commission hearings about merchants of death. That's what they called them. That's what the book was called. Senator Nye was the one who convened these hearings. And they were the students, 60,000 students had signed an oath. I will never go to a foreign war. There were 135,000 students organized for one day in 1935. This is not unthinkable. But immediately, the bigs who didn't want to lose all that money that they could make by developing and selling and storing and using weapons, did everything they could to deploy their lobbyists and control the media and squelch or you know support opponents of any elected officials that were promoting this uh, merchants of death investigation, and they squelched it. They, but and and they'll do it again. We saw that writ large with the Democratic 
national committee. And I think people don't even know what they're doing who are organizing these big you know, extravaganzas. They're just told, you know, make a lineup and ask the people who aren't going to rock the boat to speak. The hardest bit for me to imagine in all of that is a journalist at a corporate media outlet writing an obituary of some billionaire and calling them a merchant of death. I don't know that we have the culture in which that happens. Maybe we need to start drafting the obituaries for these good people ourselves and putting them out there. I, it might be an idea. Um, we, we've got just a, a few minutes left. Kathy Kelly, uh, as president of World Beyond War, I know one of the other big campaigns that we work on is Closing Bases, which is going to be the theme of our upcoming annual conference. Um, do you want to talk about that, uh, that campaign or any other uh, work that you're doing? I hope your listeners will really mark off September 20th, 21st, and 22nd, and then take a look at that global map of the bases and kind of go into the weeds a little bit and see just how much those bases are affecting other people's homelands. So much has been happening at Jeju Island in Okinawa, but now there are new chapters. Greta has opened up chapters in Australia, in Africa, in South America. And we have so much to learn from these new chapters. Imagine their student groups and what they're up to and what kinds of laws they might pursue to um, really try to uphold international law. The other thing I wanna encourage people to do is, is, is if you are thinking, well, how could I get plugged in? Take one of the courses. It's a great way to get um, Plugged in, you know, I, the last time I took one of those courses, or I don't know, I was supposed to facilitate it or something, I got to know people in Senegal who are delivering this letter to the different missions to the UN, to the palace in Senegal with this brand new president. So the world is changing. It's changing quickly. And we have a responsibility to be the adults who try to, you know, steer this ship. And so I, I, I really welcome everybody who can both locally and globally become involved in World Beyond War. And thank you, David. Thank you for everything you do to keep the ship afloat. It costs money, I know, and it's also uh, a tremendous energy that's necessary. Well, thank you, Kathy Kelly, uh, for everything you've been doing and for coming on this program. Uh, people can go to worldbeyondwar.org to find those online courses and everything else uh, that we've been talking about. Um, how can people get in touch with you, Kathy? Well, you know, I, I know I have a World Beyond War email, but I, I generally, mine is kathy.vcnv at gmail.com and if anyone would like to help with um, Afghan refugees who are pretty anxious about their futures especially the young women uh, we've got 21 kind of parked in Pakistan and we're keeping a safe house going for them they can't work they uh, we haven't gotten visas for them yet to get to another country so if anyone would like to help with that, we we meet every other Thursday and we would love to welcome some more people on that effort. Thank you. One of many great projects Kathy Kelly is working on as always. Kathy, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Great that Talk World Radio is hitting the radio waves all the time. Take care. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.